Okay, thank you. It's very fun to be the uh, kickoff starter person because now I'll be able to relax and enjoy the show with all of you afterwards. Um, so we'll talk today about differentiated thyroid cancer. It's a relatively new solid tumor in most oncology practices. <clears throat> I will go over um, some data, a little bit of data that was pre presented in context with serafinib, but I will say that this has been published um, in the um, actually, both papers, big papers have been published, one in the Lancet, one in the New England Journal, so I will refer you to that if I go too fast. So I do a lot of work with the companies that are, are doing research in this space, consulting as well as advisory board, and of course, research grants for all the clinical trials that we run at my site. Um, at this time, there are three FDA-approved drugs, doxorubicin, serafinib, and lenvatinib, which was just approved a month ago. So when I talk about any other um, agents at the end, I really will just be talking about clinical trials that data will be coming out, some of which will probably even be coming out at ASCO this year. Uh, so for people who have not looked at thyroid cancer since maybe they were medicine interns, um, follicular cells that give rise to differentiated thyroid cancer are anaplastic. And so we'll be focusing just on the differentiated uh, piece of this puzzle with, that can be subdivided into papillary, follicular, and herthal cell. And the treatment is pretty straightforward. Surgery is the first line um, of defense. Then it's followed by radioactive iodine. And then TSH suppression is used because that is uh, clearly a survival benefit. If you um, know uh, thyroid cancer, there are over 60,000 new de deaths a year, but only about 2,000 deaths will be due to thyroid cancer, and that's because, of course, the vast majority are actually cured with surgery or radioactive iodine alone. But 5 to 15 percent will have resistant disease or um, you know, recurrences and, and resistant disease to radioactive iodine. And when they actually develop this, their actual overall survival is only two and a half to three and a half years. So they are certainly in need of therapy just as much as all the other solid tumors that we treat. They often suffer multiple complications. It can be an indolently but steadily progressing disease and resulting in many um, complications, bone, uh, bone lesions, fractures, pain, um, obstructive pneumonias, pleural effusions, all the things that you would um, expect. And so obviously there's a lot of morbidity involved as well as the mortality. So in, uh, the NCCN guidelines right now will tell you that you need to stop RAI treatment once it's been demonstrated that either the progressing nodules are not taking up radioactive iodine or you gave them a th therapeutic dose of radioactive iodine and now uh, the patient is progressing in less than 16 months. That means it's really not working. So you need to stop radioactive iodine treatment, suppress the TSH. This is known to have a 15% survival advantage, so we do this. We just give them a little bit super therapeutic thyroid hormone so that their TSH remains below 0.1. That's the the, that's the, um, for our patients, that's where we want to keep them. Um, and then, um, but it has to be detectable. If you go too into the undetectable range, now they'll have symptoms of, the, of hyperthyroidism. So you don't want to go too far. You want to stay in that narrow range. And then when the tumor burden is significant and progression has been documented, initiate systemic treatment. So we'll talk now about what, what systemic treatment we would do, but to know where we've come from, in the last 10 or 15 years, we know a lot more about the genetics of this disease. It's really associated with abnormalities that result in abnormal uh, intracellular se sequence uh, signaling. We have um, follicular mutations that are more prominent. We have RAS is more prominent in follicular subtypes. Papillary, many of you may know that BRAF is mutated um, as much or if not more in papillary thyroid cancer than melanoma. So the BRAF V600E mutation is definitely in play. And when you realize that the vast majority of patients are papillary, there's a very large number of uh, obviously BRAF mutated papillary thyroid cancers in this group. And then also I will say that many of these patients, especially by the time they stop re uh, responding to radioactive iodine, they may also have areas that are more poorly differentiated. They may actually start to develop RAS mutations as well. So kinase inhibitors, the ideal kinase inhibitor will do two things. They'll inhibit, obviously, the tumor growth directly, where um, you know, they'll, it, it'll interact with the intracellular signaling in the tumor cells. We know that thyroid cancer is very, very um, dependent on both the MAP kinase as well as the um, PI3 kinase AKT P10 pathway. Um, and so for that reason, those are very good targets for intracellular um, targeting. But I also tell you, that all the surgeons in the room will tell you this as well, that it's a very vascular tumor. So the VEGF receptor inhibition and the antivascular agents are also um, good agents to be considered in this setting. 
So when we, we've looked over the last few years, there have been a lot of uh, different drugs. I'm sorry, XL184 is um, cabozantinib. I, this is an old slide. But just to say that these two pathways now have many um, agents that have been studied and have been studied specifically in thyroid cancer, mostly in phase two studies, and it's universally, pretty much universally seen with one or two exceptions, that there is response, at least stabilization of disease, if not um, really good response rates. And for this reason, um, uh, some of the companies decided to move, go, move forward with a phase three study. So we'll talk about the first one. Obviously, the um, decision trial was the first phase three to go forward in this space. It's an inhibitor both of VEGF receptors, PDGFR, RAF, and RET and CKIT. It moved forward based on um, the fact that when we went to our, when we did our phase two study, we went to look for futility at our stage one step, and we had already reached our primary endpoint, showing that the activity was actually uh, several fold more than we were even anticipating. And for that reason, actually, Decision was, was drafted and started before that study was even completed. So Decision was opened and it, uh, accrued 417 patients in uh, all over the world in about, you know, 88 sites or something like that. And um, the most important thing I think that this study um, contributed in addition to the first FDA approved drug was that it really defined what this population is because it's really everybody was concerned we're going to be treating patients who could still respond to radioactive iodine so all the endocrine and nu nu nuclear medicine people were concerned. People were worried that we'd treat indolent disease that didn't need to be treated. So the definition of patients who are eligible for this kind of treatment are patients who have locally advanced or metastatic defined RAI refractory disease based on, as I said, either no uptake or um, uh, progression in spite of uptake in, a ther in the setting of a therapeutic dose. And also, they have to have progressed within 14 months. In other words, some of these patients, it's rare. I mean, a, a small number of them probably as are just transitioning into this space may have a period of quiescence of their disease. We didn't want to be treating people that were basically not growing over, um, you know, several years. So those people did not need to be treated yet. So that, um, those criteria, we'll say, have been taken and modified for the other phase threes going forward. So these have really caught on that these are really the um, the uh, eligibility criteria you need to look for. Patients were randomized to serafinib and placebo, and because serafinib was available, there was a, a crossover allowed, um, and for that reason, overall survival is not expected to be significant in this trial. Progression was then assessed, and it was looking at progression-free survival as a primary endpoint. So I presented this actually last year, but it was a positive trial with, um, with uh, a hazard ratio of 0.587. If you look first at the placebo arm, you'll notice that patients were still progressing in 5.8 months. So I think we did a very good job of identifying patients who were um, actually in need of, um, of therapy. And then what you look at is you see that the um, serafinib extended progression-free survival by five months to 10.8 months. And so based on this positive trial, it was FDA approved. A little additional information you need to know is that the response rate was 12.2%. So 12.2% of patients responded more than 30% by resist criteria. Stable disease, however, was incredibly significant. A large number of patients had that as well. And so if you look about, we consider 54% of these patients had clear um, disease control rate in, in the setting of this response. And I'll just put here the... Um, the um, waterfall chart for this for this agent, and you can see the vast majority of patients had some shrinkage. Interestingly, since um, um, you didn't need actually uh, a full 30% response for some of the symptomatic patients to become asymptomatic. I had a guy with severe dysphagia who had only about 11% response, but went from eating nothing to eating steak in about a month. So um, it, it, you really can get some good responses regardless of what the percentage is, but the bottom line is the vast majority of patients were getting benefit from this drug. So what do we know about it? You know, the duration was a very long duration for serafinib, 46.1 weeks compared to 28.3 weeks in the placebo arm. And if you actually consider that, you have to remember that when you're actually looking, when you look at the tables in the paper about AEs, because of course you're comparing a group of patients that were on a drug for twice as long as the placebo arm, and so they're not really apples to apples comparisons. Dose modifications were what we would have expected, 77.8% had either an interruption or a dose reduction. Sometimes people would go for many, many, many months actually on full dose, and their dose reduction would only come after a year. Maybe the diarrhea was going, getting a little difficult for them, and they'd have their dose reductions then. So while they had dose reductions, many of them did not happen immediately, um, but were relatively spread out through this 18-month um, period. 
um, or 11 month period, uh, plus or minus. Um, and 18% discontinued due to AEs. Only 5% of that was due to hand foot skin reaction. And I'll say that over 90% of the people who are giving this drug were giving it for the first time. So there was a real learning curve. And I think that most of us would say that the percentage of patients going off to AEs is of those of us who give the drug is significantly lower than that in our practice, but that was what it was in the trial. So one last point I just want to make about the decision trial, this was presented at ESMO, is that regardless of whether they are BRAF, wild type, or mutant, there was still a benefit in the hazard ratio. In other words, it didn't matter. Genetics did not play a role in determining who got a benefit in this, in this um, patient population. So BRAF mutations should not be used to determine who should get treatment with serafinib. And the same is true of the RAS mutations, although I point out, remember what I said, RAS mutations are much more prevalent in the poorly differentiated group. So as a group, RAS mutated patients do worse. It's a very small number of patients, but I'll say that the hazard ratio still also favors serafinib, so there does still seem to be a benefit. However, going forward in our research, I think that this group of patients will really benefit from possibly some more aggressive approaches up front. So perhaps they might be um, candidates for combination therapy um, from the get-go. It's only about 10% of the patients, but they do tend to fail sooner than the others. So decision um, 5.8 PFS um, uh, in the placebo versus 10.8 um, in the treatment arm associated with similar toxicities, all of which were manageable. Um, serafinib was the first MKI inhibitor um, to be FDA approved, and that was a year ago, November. And it was, uh, it's active in both BRAF and RAS mutant as well as wild type. So genetic testing is not, uh, should not be used to, to determine these patients. Now the big excitement at ASCO, for those of us who follow the thyroid world, is the presentation that Martin Schlumberger did about the, um, the SELECT trial. So many of the same groups of people that were involved in the decision then went, on, went ahead and accrued to this trial. And it was basically had a similar design with some differences. And you'll notice that there are differences, one of the, which is that the progression was actually independently reviewed. And so the criteria that the um, independent review for the eligibility um, in, imposed was that these patients tended to progress much more rapidly. In other words, these were much more, um, this was a much more aggressive group of patients. It's not totally clear why that is. Part of the reason might have been that the new resist criteria actually are a little bit more, um, the progression, the, the, um, to define progression, it's a little bit more aggressive definition. Slight differences, um, but for whatever reason, this did uh, lead to a slight shift in the placebo arm, which you'll see. Patients had to have uh, measurable disease. And interestingly, and this is what I consider one of also the most important contributions of this paper as well, is the fact that they allowed a prior VEGF receptor inhibitor. So we were actually allowed to see what this agent would do in the second line setting. So stratified by region, randomized um, to um, two to one to lenvatinib or placebo, same primary endpoint PFS, was allowed to have crossover, for, so overall survival was not expected to be significant in this patient population. So here was the um, Kaplan-Meier curve that was presented at ASCO uh, last June, and what you'll see uh, is that, of course, the beautiful, not just a two-finger test, but the FIST test uh, is positive on this slide, um, with a, a, an extension of the pl placebo um, PFS from 3.6 months to 18.3 months. So a huge improvement um, in progression-free survival. And, but, but remember also, this is a different population, placebo arm of 3.6 months, so also a more aggressive uh, group of patients. So this is really um, quite remarkable and has led to, to a lot of excitement in the field. And this is also my, my second favorite slide probably from this, and, and in some ways my, my favorite, because of course my clinic is full of patients who've now been pre-treated with other agents. And what you'll see is that whether they had no previous therapy or a previous signal, single arm of therapy, it didn't matter. Progression-free survival was vastly improved, the difference being 18 months, 15 months instead of 18 months. But at the end of the day, lumbatinib was clearly very, very active, both in the first line as well as the second line setting. So an extremely active drug, a lot of excitement about this. And of course, this led to it being FDA approved, I'll just tell you, last month. So it was a very brand new, hot off the press drug um, and, and is now available. We've had our first patients get shipment already um, through, um, through you know, regular insurance mechanisms. So the one thing I want to sort of caution you a little bit with um, linvatinib is that um, well, let's first talk about complete responses. Again, wonderful data. 63% of patients had large shrinkages of more than 30%. So they had partial response of 63%. And then the additional group, about 15%, had um, stable disease. So we're talking about a very good, again, um, active drug, but in this case, maybe a few more responders in this clinical population. 
Um, and the time to objective response was only two months. So people really rapidly declined and then, um, and then eventually plateaued. Overall survival is, as expected, somewhat, you know, parallel because when patients progressed at two, four, six months, they were allowed to pass o uh, cross over and get lenvatinib. So because a large number of patients crossed over, we, do not ex we did not expect the overall survival um, to be a positive study, the same as decisions. So in that way, the two trials are similar. Um, duration of treatment was 13.8 months on lenvatinib versus 3.9 months on the placebo arm. Dose intensity was 16.8 milligrams. Now that's important because the starting dose was 24 and the time to the first dose reduction was three months. So that is vastly different from what we saw with serafinib and you might immediately ask me why. And I think I put that slide in. So the main reason was that there were treatment adverse events, as you can imagine, and the ones that, and many of them resulted in dose reduction. The vast majority of them um, in that first two-month period were people who went up to blood pressures that were over 200, over, you know, 120. I mean, we were talking about highly, highly um, elevated blood pressures. So unlike serafinib, where we might just, you know, review these patients at two weeks as far as blood pressure goes, and it is a, it is a side effect, this was so severe that at this point we're recommending patients get their blood pressure checked within three days. Um, and that actually is often a reason that patients have to be dose reduced. So um, there, are other, there are other dose um, uh, um, um, adverse events that we can talk about. Um, but also to let you know that 8% um, or 20 patients did have a fatal AE on this. And, um, and for that reason, it will be um, uh, the, the fatal AEs will have to be f further investigated. And we're not really sure whether those are due to um, the seraph, um, whether they're due to the blood pressure or maybe also there were um, quite a few um, episodes of um, emboli, so clots, clots in both arterial as well as venous, five, um, five of, in each, of each type were found, and many of these were over grade three. So thromboembolic phenomena are, are much more prevalent with this and has to be watched. Also proteinuria seems to be a big deal and also inhibiting um, our ability to treat a lot of our patients at full dose. So you really have to watch the kidneys, you really have to watch hypertension, and you really have to watch for clots. And the problem with that is that the patients are like, oh, I like this one better than serafinib because they don't have hand-foot syndrome, but these are things that are keeping me up at night, whereas I know they're not going to die of their hand-foot syndrome. So you're going to have to balance. I will tell you at the end of the day, all of my patients will get both drugs. So it just means what are you paying attention to when you're giving these drugs. So in conclusion, it's a highly, highly active drug with a PFS of 14, 7 point, of an addition of 14.7 months over placebo, and also the response rate was high with um, an average 63% pa patients. So the last thing I'll say is that the, the, the and toxicities were manageable, but as a, again, you have to look at hypertension, thromboembolic phenomenon, and proteinuria and renal failure. So those are things that you'll be picking up more on your lab tests and your clinical exam more than they'll be complaining and coming to you with those problems. Now, patients who on both decision and select had much shorter PFSs, and what we don't know, and I'm not sure the study will ever be done, we'll have to figure out how to do it, is which do you do first? So that's the elephant in the room. What do you do first? Because we know serafinib works, but we don't know if serafinib will be as good in the second line setting to lenvatinib, but we do know that lenvatinib is good in the second line setting to serafinib. So that's going to be something that we'll have to decide. I will say that their patients, if they're symptomatic and really need a big response, that might be a patient that I would choose to do lenvatinib first. For patients that I think are going to be on these drugs for a very long time, I might start with serafinib first, go for as long as I could, and then switch them to lenvatinib. But a sequencing study, of course, would answer that the best. Um, and then both are now FDA approved, and the s safety and efficacy is available for both. So I'll just point out a couple of new data that you're going to hear coming up. So we did a trial also with serafinib. We took patients who progressed on serafinib, and based on some data we had from the lab that showed that the mTOR pathway was highly upregulated in patients at the time of progression, we took patients when they were on serafinib, and we added in everolimus. And that was good because it kind of was treating this heterogeneity of the disease. And we've now fully accrued this trial, and the abstract has been submitted to, Ab um, to ABSCO. Haven't heard if it's accepted yet, but this hopefully will be published um, around ASCO or a little bit afterwards, and, and the data will be out. So this might also be another um, down-the-line uh, approach we can take with our patients, remembering that these patients often will be around for many years. And then I will also say that vemurafenib has shown activity. This was presented at ESMO over a year ago, um, and this paper, this manuscript is currently in revisions as, as well. So um, you'll have a couple of other options after serafinib and lenvatinib, so I just want to let you know them coming down the line. 
line. And I'll say Cabozantinib, I think that there's a, a phase two in the second line setting that might be presented this year at ASCO, but we are also doing it in the first line, a study that had started before all these approvals came forward. And um, this also is an active drug showed in the phase one setting showed clear activity in differentiated thyroid cancer. And in many of my patients, after they've had multiple other treatments, has been a wonderful third, third line. So these are other drugs that I think are coming down the pike. So in summary, it's a vascular tumor. Their phase three trials, decision and select were both positive with FDA approvals. Verify is a third, and Vendetinib is a third F, uh, phase three that's going also has activity. And so um, we'll hear about that maybe in another year from now and that other MKIs are also in development in combination or sequentially. So um, I think that's all I have to say. Marcia, thank you so much. Let's <laughs>